But in the cases where you can take advantage of a unique resource, they can be a really valuable competitive advantage and really help you reduce your costs in a significant way. So in another example from Siberia, uh, it turns out that one of the most profitable uh, electrical in energy producers, like energy plants in, in, in the country of Russia is in Northern Siberia. And, and it's so profitable because it's so freaking cold there that they don't have to cool any of their equipment uh, with air conditioning or anything like that. They don't need water cooling or air cooling. They just, they just leave it out to the elements and the, uh, you know, the components stay warm because of all the electricity that's being produced. So they don't break down, uh, but they don't need to be externally cooled. So they save a huge amount of cost from not having to cool this stuff. And they, uh, and so they're incredibly productive. And I, I put a, a Wall Street Journal article on the As You Learn site about, about this. Uh, I think it's really interesting, uh, but this is exactly what they're talking about. Having a unique resource that allows them to have a, a cost and capital efficiency strategy that isn't, uh, that is very sustainable. You know, the only way you copy it is also build a plant up in some really cold, frigid climate, uh, which is, isn't always feasible. Uh, or reasonable, because of course you gotta be able to have employees up there too. And there's another one that's really similar that's in the US uh, when Bitcoin mining got really big. Uh, Bitcoin mining, uh, as it got more and bigger and bigger required a huge amount of computing power to calculate this problem, to try and solve for the solutions and generate new Bitcoins. And uh, you know, when it started, like when I first heard about it, you could, you could mine Bitcoins on your own computer. Uh, and you could generate Bitcoins. But by the time it got famous, you needed massive warehouses with servers just running constantly, trying to solve this incredibly difficult problem. And every solution, every time you got a new solution, you got a new Bitcoin. And of course, running computers, you know, I'm sure you've sat next to a computer or in a computer lab, starts to get really hot. And so one of the biggest costs associated with Bitcoin mining was these massive servers, or actually running any kind of server farm, like Google or Amazon or anything like that, is cooling it keeping it cool so the computers don't break down. Uh, and uh, I was in Duluth recently, and um, about a year ago, Duluth, northern Minnesota, right on the, the lake. And they, uh, the guy that was you know, sort of giving me a tour was showing me these warehouses that didn't have any windows in them. And they were Bitcoin miners. And they just, to avoid the whole cooling process, you know, it gets you know, negative 20 in the winter. They just didn't have windows. And so then they didn't have to pay for any cooling and they were generating processing Bitcoins and, and saving huge amounts of money on, uh, on, uh, on cooling the computers. Okay, so that's a, that's a, that is a unique resource that you could take advantage of if you thought about it enough in advance, right? Now, if you're building your warehouse in, uh, in Texas or in Florida and it didn't occur to you until you'd already built it, then it's not really something you can take advantage of, right? You, you can't just, uh, unless you're just totally wealthy and you don't care, you're, you're not going to tear down your warehouse and rebuild it all in Duluth because you realized you should have built there in the first place and then you could have taken advantage of this unique resource. But if you can, it's, a, it's very sustainable, right? It's not going to not be cold in Duluth anymore. And so the ability for you to use that is, uh, is, or, or, uh, is, is ongoing and the sustainability of your advantage is ongoing to the extent that your competitors don't realize it and then copy it if they can, right? So there are uh, unique resources that can allow you to have cost advantages, uh, but they would require significant planning in advance to take advantage. And if your competitors do the same thing, then you don't get the cost advantage, right? You both have the same cost, then you don't, uh, you don't have a, a value advantage relative to them. All right, now the last two are really, really similar. And one of them we've already talked about and that is something called economies of scale. Now, economies of scale, again, is the idea that the bigger you are, the more benefits you have to being to adding customers, to the more benefits you have to getting even bigger. Once you are of a certain size, then getting even bigger just makes you better off. And there are a lot of examples of uh, benefit of, of economies of scale. eBay, one of them, right? The bigger that eBay got, the better off they were by adding more customers because that just continued to snowball. They, they had very little cost from adding additional consumers or, and sellers and buyers. And the bigger they got, the more sellers and buyers wanted to join them. And they had even lower cost of adding all those additional people, right? So uh, they have economies to scale that uh, uh, once they got uh, to a certain size were hard to, uh, were hard to beat. And the economies to scale happened to some extent Pretty much across the board, uh, at a, at a certain size, uh, you 
your infrastructure allows you to take advantage of things that other people won't. Right? So for instance, we're gonna spend a lot of time in this class, we're gonna do the valuation model based on UPS and FedEx. So we'll talk a lot about UPS and FedEx, but they have they enjoy now a huge economy to scale because they have implemented such an enormous amount of infrastructure already that anybody trying to compete is not going to be able to compete effectively because they would then have to spend way more money, way more capital than UPS and FedEx in order to build the similar infrastructure. Right? So they can keep adding customers because the infrastructure is already built out. Right? If we think about our web van example, one of the reasons why Webvan was struggling so much is because they had to spend an enormous amount of capital just building the infrastructure. But once it was built, then they would have enjoyed economies to scale. Once you already have warehouses and trucks and everything else in a city, then delivering to one extra person in the city is just making more money for the most part. It's one of the reasons why Amazon so successfully moved into the grocery delivery business. They, they, they bought Whole Foods, and then they had distribution centers all over the world. And so all they had to do was manage the shipments of all the Whole Foods food uh, to all over their distribution centers. And then they already had the logistics and supply chain in place to get all that delivered in an efficient manner. So they enjoyed enormous economies to scale and selling more and more groceries just made them more and more money because all of that stuff was already in place. Right? Now, a scalable process is slightly different thing than economies to scale, okay? So a scalable product process is a, is a business that is scalable, meaning they benefit from getting bigger, whereas economies to scale refers to the fact that once you're already big, you, also, you, you, benefit, you, you benefit from gaining more, uh, more size, right? So again, this is a distinction. UPS is not a scalable business. When they first started, they had to spend a huge amounts of money to scale, to get bigger. That's what scaling means, get bigger, grow scale, right? So they had to spend huge amounts of money. They had to build distribution centers. They had to buy trucks. They had to buy planes. They had to hire employees. They had to develop systems. They had to do all this stuff. That is not a scalable business. If they had a competitor that was already established, they would have been crushed, but they didn't. They managed to scale effectively. Once they got to scale, they enjoyed economies of scale because now that they're so big that they have distribution everywhere, adding more customers is just generating profit, not generating cost. Whereas eBay both has a scalable business and economies to scale. Right? So eBay is easy to scale because adding more customers just meant adding more bandwidth and putting another server on. Right? If eBay wanted to allow people in China to sell on eBay, they didn't need to open up a distribution warehouse in China. They just needed to add another couple of servers and make sure that their bandwidth between the US and China was fine. And boom, that was it. They're done. Right? So they have an incredibly easy business to scale. And once they're big, they also enjoy economies of scale. Right? So it's sort of the double whammy. So scalable businesses aren't the same as businesses that enjoy economies to scale because most businesses eventually enjoy some economies of scale, whereas most businesses aren't necessarily scalable in practice. But this is scale scalability is something that is actively striven for. That's a goal that we can actually give to management team. We can say, listen, if we can find a way to convert your business into one that is more scalable, and then that means that we can grow the business cheaper without additional costs. That is an absolutely great way to create value. And so you see this happening a lot, right? It, one of the biggest ways it's happening is in the software industry, right? And what you might, again, it depends on how old you are, but you know, for instance, all computer software used to be sold on CD. You wanted a copy of Windows, you had to get a CD. You wanted a video game, you had to get a CD. You wanted a, you know, Adobe or, or anything like that, Microsoft Word, all of it came on CD. You had to install it on CD. And you bought a copy. You bought a physical copy one time. And then if they had an update, you had to buy another one and reinstall it, right? So you had to pay each time there was an update. But that's almost totally non-existent anymore. Nowadays, most software is sold on a subscription model. Even like Windows and, and Microsoft Office and Adobe, all of that, you just pay a fee per year they install it on your computer locally, I mean, uh, the, across the web, so they, you just download the copy, they don't send you a CD. And then if they have an update, they just download the update to you. And you just keep paying every year, regardless of whether they're making new product or not. 
So they've turned a, product, a business that wasn't necessarily scalable. It had all these physical components. They had to make the CDs. They had to ship the CDs. They had to you know, associate the cost. If they didn't have a new product, they didn't have new revenue to one where they don't have any physical options. Adding an additional customer to Adobe now is as simple as clicking the download button. And they just continue to generate revenue from you every year. So you see this big time in the tech space. That's why all of the tech companies are going to that method. Uh, or at least that's definitely one of the reasons. It's a little bit harder in other sort of more physical um, situations. One of the coolest ones, I think, or the most unique ones uh, comes from Uber and Lyft. Uh, so you wouldn't think that Uber or Lyft would be a really scalable business. It's a taxi. You need a car. You need a driver. They take one person to the, you know, they pick up at a stop. Scaling that business, adding additional customers means you have to have additional cars or additional drivers, additional routes, whatever that might be. But actually, they came up with a kind of unique way to me, which is that they added uh, the, the Uber share or the, you know, the, the share rides where multiple people could sign up to get in the same car if they were going on a similar route. And then the driver would just drop them off in a row and they would save, they would charge you a little bit less. But ultimately, the driver would have a higher fare overall and the company would make more money overall. So they turned something that really shouldn't have been scalable into something that was scalable. With the caveat, of course, that that was only going to be an effective value creating strategy if people were willing to do it, if people considered that to be the same as taking their own Uber. And it didn't turn out to be that way. So it was kind of a cool idea. But it, in most markets, it didn't turn out that people were really willing to share their cars with strangers uh, very often. And so it didn't really help them scale their business as much as they hoped it would.